Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive functions. This show is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. These conversations will introduce mental tools that will empower you to shift your mindset for a successful life. And now, here's your host, Sucheta Kamath. All right. Welcome back to Full Prefrontal, where we are exposing the mysteries of executive function. I am here as always with our host, Sucheta Kamath. Good morning, my friend. Uh, good to be with you as always. I understand we're going to be talking about aging and Alzheimer's today. Yes, we are. And, you know, this reminds me of David Bowie's quote. He once said that if you are pinning for youth, I think it produces a stereotypical old man because you only live in memory. You live in a place that doesn't exist. Aging is an extraordinary process where you become the person you always should have been. I love that quote. And that, uh, of course, is uh, such a nudge for us to age gracefully. But yeah, today's topic, particularly from cognition and executive function, we will be talking about more towards the sunset uh, years of our life. Uh, not everybody's as lucky to have the intact uh, set of uh, skills or thinking, and that can cause a great disruption. Well, you know, as you know, Sucheta, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's uh, uh, just over four years ago now. It has been, oh, I'm not going to deny it, it has been a very difficult and very painful journey for all of us. But it has also been, to be very frank, a fascinating one to see how what this disease has done to her. She's, she's uh, what they would now classify as late stage Alzheimer's, but with organized thinking. And so what that means to those listening is that, yeah, she has, in essence, zero short-term memory. But she has organized thinking, which means that she can still dress herself. She can still make her bed. She can still do some personal effects like brushing teeth and combing hair and all that. Uh, and she still can enjoy social outings. But it is interesting to spend time with, uh, with a human being who has no short-term memory. It's a, it's a real challenge. Uh, it has been a very difficult, but to be very frank, uh, fascinating thing to observe. And it has the, the disease has not yet impacted her general health. So she's still in pretty good health otherwise, which is, you know, <laughs> that brings its own challenges as well. But it, uh, uh, it has been a, a fascinating journey. What, what's been really, really fascinating about it is frankly what we've learned going through it and the little tricks, the little hacks, the strategies that you come up with that enable you to interact and spend quality time with someone like that. I and mean, you really can't talk about the future. You can't talk about the past, uh, certainly the the immediate past. And so what you your whole essence of the time together is to create these these present moment of joys, you know? And so that's that's what you do and that's what you strive for. But it's a horrifying, terrible disease. It's just I don't wish it on anyone. But, you know, it's also family, loving family and taking care of each other. And it's what you're supposed to do, you know. Absolutely. And I'm so sorry. And I have gotten to know uh, some of your struggles since you and I started working with each other. And I know how taxing it has been on uh, your own relationship with her, as well as uh, having to manage uh, personal life, professional life, and uh, now this added responsibility of making sure your mother is safe and kind of has that support that she needs, which she may not recognize that you're offering it. I know, do you mind sharing some of the things that you, um, how did it start? When, how did you notice her, uh, the changes in her thinking, her behaviors? What kind of alerted you all that this could be Alzheimer's? Yeah, well, and I'll be honest, uh, she was exhibiting symptoms of this disease years before she was officially diagnosed. And like I said, that was 2014, four years ago when she was officially diagnosed, but we had certainly noticed a change in her probably a good two years prior to that, maybe even three. But, you know, it manifested itself in some, I guess, not surprising ways, always was meticulous about how she maintained her house and her wardrobe. And, you know, if you said, mom, we're leaving at 530, she would be ready at 525 every time. 
And then all of a sudden that just stopped and she would just repeat, uh, what time are we leaving? What time are we heading out? What do I need to wear? Uh, where are we going? Who are we seeing? You know, and, and so it's different than all of us have a slip of the memory, right? We'll forget something and, hey, honey, remind me about what we're doing. But it you know, becomes a, a constant thing. And so that was, that was the original real main symptom was, you know, she'd always been so careful about her punctuality and, and knowing exactly when and where and why she was supposed to be doing something. And then all of a sudden that just disappeared. And then, you know, the, the, the notion of misplacing things, you know, so not knowing where the dishwasher uh, soap was or, you know, where she would have the right kind of socks or, you know, those little kind of things, things that she could have done blind and, and found in the dark and, and had, you know, was always so meticulously organized and maintained her house in such a way that, that, you know, everyone always knew where everything was. So, and that stopped, you know, so, you know, these things that had been demonstrated over her entire lifetime all of a sudden. And, and so that's when you get a, a, a real wake up call that there is definitely something going on. Got it. Got it. And, you know, as a speech and language pathologist who specializes in uh, neurological disorders, my work always has centered around helping people build memories and developing organizational skills and planning and self-efficiency uh, or self-awareness skills. Last several years, I have stopped working with uh, people with dementia or any type of memory related problems with aging, but I have done a lot of work in my earlier career. I mean, or rather at the start of my career. But when I do see clients with age-related memory challenges, a lot of them come to me because they have had a head injury. So recently I saw a woman, she was kind of young. Uh, she was only 59 and she was um, had climbed on uh, this drop-down ladder from the attic uh, to get something and she fell backwards and hit an empty aquarium, home mm. aquarium that she had, and she hit her head, the back of the head. And of course, uh, you know, the aquarium broke her fall and that kind of got her to the uh, hospital, to the then neurologist. And eventually she landed in my office uh, for attention, memory and executive function problems. But as I started working with her, a lot of uh, my um, my assessment was that she's not showing typical memory problems. They were looking like something uh, she's having significant memory. Like she once, well, what became very evident to me, one day she called me and she said, I am trying to get to you. How do I get to you? So I said, oh, I'll text you your, my address. And did you lose my address? And she said, no, no, no. I am on my way to get to you. How do I get to you? And mm -hmm. I couldn't understand that question. What was she trying to say? And yeah. So I said, where are you? So she said, I'm in the parking lot. And so I said, oh, oh well, what parking lot? And she she said, store, store parking lot. So I said, which store? So that was so not, you know, that's very abnormal or an unusual yeah. way of describing post head injury kind of thing. So basically she, for a moment, had lost bearing of where she was in space and time. She couldn't figure out that she was in the Target parking lot, which was in Roswell, and she needed to come to Buckhead area, and she needed to take uh, 400 and then take this exit. She kind of lost the bearing where she was. Anyway, that was the kind of thing I said that's extremely unusual. And then I started discussing more about her daily routines. And one of the things that was helping her not be detected or nobody getting suspicious, but she was extremely organized and she had systems and she was not doing a lot of new things. So anyways, I think this is a, a um, such an important topic. And I know this is a, a veering a little bit into more than just executive function, but I do think that a lot of uh, ways that people with uh, who are helping people manage uh, family members require this understanding. And that's why I thought it would be great for us to talk about this guest I have today. He's a very special friend and expert, and I'm so excited. So let me tell you a little bit about him. Today, we have Dr. Kenneth Kosick. He has served as a professor at the Harvard Medical School from 1996 till 2004. That's where I met him. And when he became the Harriman Professor and co-director of the Neuroscience Research Center Institute at the University of California in Santa Barbara. He has been, received multiple, multiple awards. I'm going to list a few, such as Whitaker Health Science Award from MIT, Milton Foundation Award from Harvard Medical School, Moore Award from American Association of Neuropathologists, 
Metropolitan Life Award, Denny Brown Award for from American Neurological Associations, and so on and so on. As you can see, he has a prolific career and incredibly celebrated uh, individual who has made a lot of contributions. He has co-authored two important books. One is called Outsmarting Alzheimer's Disease, and second is called The Alzheimer's Solution, How Today's Care is uh, Failing Millions and How Can We Do Better? And that we will be talking a lot about what to do in our next segment, and I will be referring to that book. It's a great book. Everybody should have it. His work, including characterization in Colombia of the largest family in the world with familial Alzheimer's, has appeared in New York Times, Wall Street Journal, in The New Yorker. It has been also uh, referenced to on BBC, CNN, PBS, and even CBS 60 Minutes. His 2016 UCSB uh, com you know, commencement address was archived at the Graduation Wisdom Best Commencement Speeches website. And um, I really recommend everybody should listen to him. He's extremely inspirational, and it's uh, my honor to have him with us today. Well, Sucheta, I, I learned something from every one of your conversations, but goes without saying, I'm particularly looking forward to your conversation with Dr. Kosick. So let's get to it. Here is Sucheta's first of two conversations with Dr. Ken Kosick. Welcome to the podcast, Ken, and I hope you don't mind me calling you Ken instead of Dr. Kosick. I have had the privilege of knowing you and having seen you present and, and have had many banters with you, so I'm very excited to have you here. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Let's dive into uh, your expertise. You know, we all know we are heading towards old age, and yet we hardly think about it. Or maybe the truth is that we will be paralyzed if we think too much about it. But the fear of losing uh, one's mental faculty can be a great concern to everyone. So for starters, do you mind walking us through the difference between brain farts, as I like to call them, uh, versus, uh, related to old age versus dementia and Alzheimer's disease? Sure. So the individuals, as, as we get older, we all have some decline in our mental function. It's really uh, kind of a slowing a little bit. It's not always necessarily a decrease in intelligence or problem solving. In fact, some things like problem solving actually get better as we age. And it is really um, very common as we age to develop some retrieval problems, some difficulties in retrieving names, for instance, and memories are not always as accessible, whether they're short-term memories or long-term, but mostly short-term. And that is that's very common. Then there is a kind of a gray zone where people have those same problems, but they seem to cross over a line that really now begins to be worrisome. And because that line is a little bit indistinct, we have a lot of trouble about knowing for sure when an elder begins to have memory complaints, whether or not it's the opening shot of Alzheimer's disease or as part of what we might call cognitive aging is the more is the term that's now used. Another term might be normal, normal aging. There are a very small percentage of people that will maintain their cognition perfectly well into their 90s. There are Pablo Picasso, an amazing artist, uh, painted brilliantly into his 90s. So it can happen. But this small amount of decline is incredibly common. Number one, it would be very nice to be able to give that a boost. And number two is we want to be really, really increasingly vigilant as to detecting when a person is likely to go over the line and begin to step into an Alzheimer trajectory. Now, when we start to use the term Alzheimer's, a person is already fairly far along. They really have rather frank symptoms. You can... Um, talk to the person and you would very quickly know that um, there is probably something happening here. It wouldn't take very long. The difficult area is, the, as I mentioned, is this gray zone. And we have a word for that. It's called mild cognitive impairment. So there's a difference between what I called normal cognitive aging a moment ago and mild cognitive impairment. Mild cognitive impairment is probably on the way to Alzheimer's disease, whereas normal aging is not. 
So I love the way uh, you kind of sorted it out and to get us started. One is that uh, your cognitive aging or the normal signs, and you don't like my unofficial term, brain farts, but yes, I get no, it. That's okay, too. <laughs> just because I need to <laughs> No, I'm just teasing. And I think if you don't mind talking a little bit about the difference between, the, like, I think two distinct things stand out for me from my cognitive rehabilitation work and the training that I do, that this slowing, uh, you know, cognitive slowing, there's a processing speed that kind of reduces. And second thing is, as you mentioned, the retrieval in memory, you know, that normal aging is quite, you know, we go to a party and my husband is nudging me already saying that, who's that now? You know, (laughs) what's his name or what's his wife's name? Those kinds of things. And I'm almost like his name bank. You know, he refers to me to find out relational or some details. And, And so that part, I feel, versus the short-term memory developing or managing short-term memory. Could you talk a little bit about the distinction between the two? How does that normal person understand it? Does those who don't understand neuroscience much? Yeah. Well, these are often clinical types of decisions that may not require a deep understanding of um, neuroscience, but really more of a very astute clinician. You know, with regard to your going to a party and um, your husband asking you, the, there is data that says that memory can be served in a very positive way with a long marriage. And maybe that has something to do with the fact that um, couples um, now can double their memory bank by uh, asking each other things that one alone would have forgotten. But I think um, we can be very descriptive and uh, say, there are these retrieval problems, there are, there are these issues, and I think that's useful. One, I'm not sure I'm actually answering your question perfectly, because you know we do want to put metrics on this, and there are a lot of neuropsychological tests that can be done. If a person's worried, they should see a neuropsychologist, and they can put numbers on it. And if they're not going to get a clear answer with one visit, they can wait six months, do it again, and see if it stayed steady, then you have nothing to worry about, or if it's Got begun it. to decline then you have something to worry about. But I think what you were, I, maybe what you were getting at is, is that because when people get older and that, that are not on the path to Alzheimer's, they would still really like to have a boost in their memory. I mean, this is something we all, we all want. So that is a very tricky problem because th- there's no fountain of youth that we're aware of. How can we really uh, best enhance people who have this normal cognitive aging issue? And I think that we'll get to that when we start talking about therapies, but I want to identify that issue as being out there. I'll say one more thing in this vein, and that is that um, when in my clinics over the years, when I see individuals uh, come in worried about memory complaints, I would say maybe as many as half of them, I'm able to reassure them and tell them, I don't think it's Alzheimer's because this, number one, we're all worried about Alzheimer's. Number two, cognitive aging is a real thing. People come in worried. It's nice to get reassurance from a doctor, but it still doesn't solve the fact that they can't retrieve a name in a party. Yes, that's great. So well, can you then define, uh, is dementia same as Alzheimer's disease? And what is the definition of Alzheimer's disease? So dementia is not the same as Alzheimer's disease. The Alzheimer's disease is a type of dementia. Dementia simply means that there's an impairment in cognition. You have not just trouble with memory, but there is also trouble in other cognitive spheres, such as calculations, executive function, many things that we can begin to itemize. Another sphere that is often affected in dementia, and particularly in Alzheimer's, but in many different types of dementia, is personality. So We have the cognitive domain, and we have more of an emotional personality domain. They both uh, tend to get affected. So, as I said, just so now to go back, there are many types of dementia. There are just that's a long, a long list. When you see a neurologist, because you may be concerned about it, the job of the neurologist is to figure out what type of dementia you have, assuming there is a cognitive impairment, and If the neurologist then comes to the conclusion that's Alzheimer's, they're looking for the following things. One, very slow, inexorable course in which there has been 
progression of impairment over years, not over weeks or even months. This is a slowly progressive disease. You know, I've had several examples where someone will come into the clinic and say, oh, you know, my father went off to the grocery store and uh, he got lost, couldn't find his way back home. And now they are concerned about the onset of a problem because the guy got lost. But all you have to do is ask the person, say, well, what happened before? And it turns out that a year earlier, he may have stopped keeping his checkbook. Maybe his wife took that over. And even before that, he might have been communicating a little less. So there's many antecedents to these precipitous events that people often pinpoint as the onset. Slow, inexorable course, number one. Number two, you really want to, uh, I sort of alluded to this a little bit in my discussion of dementia, but it's particularly apropos for Alzheimer's, where you want to identify impairments in more than one cognitive domain, not just memory, as I said before, but if you can also say there's a personality problem, there's something else going on, that's important because Alzheimer's disease affects many regions of the brain. And if it's a pure memory problem, pure memory problem, it's probably not Alzheimer's. There are other conditions that cause pure memory loss. And then there's a number of tests that can be done. We might want to go into that at some point to pin it down. Say one last thing, which is, is that often Alzheimer's disease until recently has been a diagnosis of exclusion. So it's very important for the clinician to do some simple tests that rule out other possible causes of dementia. There's just a few blood tests and other scans that can be done. We can talk more about that if you like. Yes. I mean, I was going to come to that part about how do you diagnose Alzheimer's. But so let me just quickly ask you this question. So the progression is slow, hence the person experiencing the symptoms himself may not be aware of this cognitive change or maybe chalked off as a normal aging related oopsies. And then second, as you said, that impairments in more than one domains such as, you know, executive function, personality, and those are more evident to other people. But a lot of times, uh, many of these elderly folks are isolated or they're interacting with their peers or their spouses in isolation, and it may not be evident clearly. So do you think we should talk about the neurobiology of Alzheimer's? Or do you think, uh, would you like to go and talk about how to evaluate uh, for Alzheimer's? Well, we can do both. Let's uh, first just say a word about the neurobiology. The neurobiology really is in some ways um, simple because from the time of Alois Alzheimer, he very clearly pointed out that the brain fills up with neurofibrillary tangles made up of a protein called tau and these senile plaques made up of a protein called amyloid, amyloid beta. They are uh, pathological entities that, are, that accumulate in the brain the tau protein accumulates inside neurons to make these tangles and ultimately strangles them, and then the cells die. The amyloid oozes out around the neurons in the uh, interstices of the brain and ends up creating these plaques that are also damaging. And those are the two entities that were the classic hallmarks. They're easy to see under a microscope. Until recently, they've been impossible to see in a living individual. So this does go neatly into your question about evaluation, because now, and when I say now, I mean really only in the last couple of years, we can actually image these two classical hallmarks directly in a living person. These are called PET scans, one PET amyloid, the other PET tau, that allow us to see that pathology and make diagnoses in, um, in the living individual if there's some question. And is it uh, recommended, is it essential, or is it more important and relevant in a, a person who is younger than typical age of uh, onset uh, for Alzheimer's? Yeah, very, very good question. So these tests are actually not recommended, not because they're dangerous or anything like that. They are expensive, and the, because there would be no treatment implication at this time, if your test is positive or negative, they're not widely recommended. They are recommended if one is in doing research. If you're trying out a drug and you want to see if that drug is actually affecting the stigmata of Alzheimer's disease, the plaques and tangles, then it's mandatory. Then you have to do it. 
So these tests are important to validate drugs, number one. And then number two, it's exactly what you said. Sometimes we have cases that it's really unclear. They're, they're so young. Why are they getting a disease that looks like Alzheimer's? So if we're perplexed clinically, that would be another reason to order these tests. What's the age range when somebody gets diagnosed with Alzheimer's and when is it too young to be having Alzheimer's? Well, as you probably know, there are genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease where people have gotten it as young as in their 20s. That is um, remarkably young. Yeah. But, but there are other families more commonly, and when I say more commonly, I'm still talking about a rare condition in which there is also a genetic cause and they tend to get it in their 40s or 50s. Let me say a word to sort of unpack that a little bit, because the genetics is something that um, it's important to understand in this in this modern world where genetics is available to all of us. You just you know send away your saliva or your blood and you get your genes back from various companies. So in the case of Alzheimer's disease, there are a small group of people, probably less than one percent, who have these really bad genes. They're bad in the sense that um, they have a very high likelihood of causing early onset disease, usually, as I say, in the 40s or 50s, but as young as in the 20s. It's inherited. The technical word is an autosomal dominant. That means that it's inherited from one generation to the next, and each child, if the parent has the gene, each child has a 50% chance of inheriting it, just like you have a 50-50 chance of giving birth to a boy or a girl. If the mother has it or the father, doesn't matter which one, the child has a 50-50 chance. So in a, a large family, you might you know, see half of the children have it. And these uh, genes are, uh, if you have the gene, they're what are called, another technical word here is they're highly penetrant. So if you have one of these genes, you're very likely to go on and get the disease. Fortunately, they're rare. We, uh, there's, as I say, very low percentage. Now let's go over to the remaining 99 or you know 99.5 percent of people. We call all the rest of the people who get their disease at an early, at a later age uh, sporadic disease, but it doesn't mean they're totally home free with regard to genes. We do know that if you have a parent with Alzheimer's disease, your risk goes up a bit, not hugely, but it does go up. So there is some something that can be inherited, and we now know that. One of these genes that is now common, maybe 25% of the Caucasian population, we know less about those numbers in other groups, but it's probably a very similar number in everybody. About 25% of people will have a risk factor gene called APOE4. If you have that gene, your risk goes up. So there are these genetic factors that are going to alter your risk. Hmm. So, wow, so much you have given us to think about. So if your parent has uh, Alzheimer's disease, does that mean you're automatically likely to have some risk? And is there a way to evaluate that risk? Well, the first one, I would say no. You're, if, you, if you have a parent with a disease, you don't want to just spend um, all your time worrying about it because while your risk goes up, it goes up a very small amount. If we look at all people that have a parent with Alzheimer's disease, the risk for the child is not very much higher than the risk for people whose parents do not have it. When I, oh, really? I, yeah, I it's, a little bit, it's a little bit higher, but not much. So the first question I would ask is, if your parent has it, how old were they when they got it? If they got it when they were well into their 80s, when Alzheimer's disease is incredibly common, you know, something like 40% of the population has Alzheimer's disease once uh, among a group that's 85 years or older. This is a very common entity among advanced age people. So, but then if, the, if I ask that question and the, and the person tells me, yeah, my, my parents had it or one parent had it and they got it when they were in their 60s, I'm going to worry a little more. So it's still not this extreme case, the very young onset, but if a parent is getting it in their 60s or 70s, I'm going to be a wee bit more concerned. Still though, the risk is not going up hugely. But if they want to sort that out and say, they, they come back to me and say, I say, okay, your risk goes up a little bit. And this post, this person says, I'm not satisfied with that, doc. I want you to tell me exactly how much my risk is going up. So, you know, you're saying a little bit, but a little bit can be a very little or just a little little. So then in those cases, 
we are now able to get genetic testing to assess risk. And one test would be for this APOE gene, APOE4, and we could then tell the person that, yeah, if you have that gene, you're, we can give you a number. We can tell you exactly how much your risk is going to go up if you have that gene. So is it worth the, uh, if um, you were the person, would you recommend yourself to go and get tested if you have that? Is that going to uh, offer the relief that one is looking for by getting this assessment done? That is the question of the day because we really, <laughs> we really want th- this whole question of disclosure and what people may want to know, uh, well, how they're going to use that information. This is the cutting edge question right now in genetics because these genetic tests, you know, I told you one gene, APOE4, but there are a few others. And, there, and, and so how much you want to know about your fate in life is a very personal matter that we all have to think very carefully about. If a person goes in and wants to have genetic testing for an incurable disease like Alzheimer's, it, they must have, according to the guidelines, they must have some genetic counseling. They must have a companion with them when they get the news. And because these are very weighty matters, they don't just affect the person who's getting the test, but it also affects their children. So it's a very important uh, question you're raising. Oh, my goodness. You're giving me so much to think about. So now that you talked about genetics, can you talk a little bit about non-genetic factors, such as person with multiple concussions or a person who has not uh, received high education? Does that impact their chances of getting Alzheimer's in their old age? We don't have a super clear answer on your question about multiple concussions. And I'll come back to that second. First, let me answer your question about education, where the answer is a little bit more clear. We have very good statistical epidemiological evidence that people with high levels of education are relatively protected from Alzheimer's disease. What we've come to learn is that that protection doesn't mean they're not going to get deep in their brains, the plaques and tangles. They'll get it like everybody else. But because of their education, they're a little bit more resilient to showing the clinical signs, the memory loss. Over the years, due to their education, they've developed more connections in their brain, more synapses. Uh, They can retrieve information in multiple different ways. They may be able to identify a bird, say, not just by its look, but by its song. And these ways, these different routes that you have to memory uh, tend to be a little richer, perhaps, in someone who is, um, who I would say is educated for sure, but education doesn't just mean formal education. It means people that have kept their minds active, even if they don't have a whole stack of degrees. Now, the so bottom line, education can stave off the symptoms, but not the underlying pathogenesis. Now, for your question on concussions, here's where it's more murky. We have pretty good evidence now that repeated head trauma, even if that head trauma is not a frank concussion, uh, repeated head trauma can lead to a kind of dementing illness, but we are still unclear whether or not that illness is strictly Alzheimer's disease because we also know there are other entities that multiple concussions lead to perhaps more commonly than Alzheimer's. So just to rephrase that, multiple concussions may increase your chances of getting Alzheimer's disease, but more prominently, it increases your chances of getting another type of dementing illness that goes by the name of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. This has been um, a very popular topic lately because so many football players have come down with this condition. Got it. So is Alzheimer's disease more common than all collective types of dementia? Yes, we can clearly say that the most common form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. And then is the the chronic traumatic encephalopathy, does that affect equally or more than uh, typical dementia and less than Alzheimer's? Or do we have any understanding of that? We don't have good epidemiologic evidence for how prevalent the chronic traumatic encephalopathy is. I don't think it's uh, 
possible. It's, it's, I'm sure it's not as common as Alzheimer's, but how common it actually is, is not known. Got it. So as we come to close up this discussion, can you talk a little bit about executive function and aging as well as executive function and, and uh, Alzheimer's disease? Because typically people uh, think about memory as a standalone feature or forgetfulness, but it's also uh, that disconnection between past and present, which helps us formulate uh, ideas about the future that becomes a huge problem for people with these progressive degenerative problems. So do you mind talking about that? Of course. Those are very intriguing ideas. The, um, the idea about uh, the use and the purpose, perhaps, uh, if we can use such a strong word, of um, memory is not so much to help us recollect the past, but to plan for the future. And when you think about memory in that way, it's a tool for the future, not necessarily for the recreating the past. There's really no necessity for memory to be completely accurate. The only uh, people that really expect an answer to you know questions like you know, what were you doing on May 5th, 2016? We don't have that kind of memory. And the only people that expect an answer to questions like that are attorneys. We really <laughs> don't have memories that are you know, video recorders. Our memories are picked up in fragments. They get processed. Information is missing. Information can be added. And what the processing is all used for is for us to better plan for the future, to be strategic, and to be able to make accurate predictions about the future. That's all we need. Because if we have to boil down brain function to one thing, it's really about making predictions. You have to be able to know that what you're going to do next is not going to kill you. And that is critical. I love that. And that is actually the essence of executive process, which is being able to predict whether it's uh, you know trajectory of your performance, your future uh, outcomes, your, your current connection to the future self. All those predictions are happening as we speak. And that's also the component of motor planning. How do we execute, right? So as we uh, close today, you have dedicated your career uh, to this uh, studying Alzheimer's. What drew you to this topic? Because it is kind of uh, very troubling and you must have seen in your clinical life a lot of uh, sad stories or, you know, that have weighed on you. What do you see in this that makes you so engaged and hopeful about this? Well, I would say it's the science that drives me. This is, uh, I am always moved by patients. I like to see patients, but the actual, what, the reason I get up in the morning and ponder these problems is because the scientific problem here, the way it's all knotted together, with the tangles and the plaques and brain function and memory and all the things we've been talking about is a really challenging, fascinating intellectual problem that totally engages me. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You have brought your uh, wisdom and uh, deep knowledge and uh, many, many listeners are going to benefit from it. So I'm really grateful for your time. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. All right. So that was Dr. Ken Kosick. As I suspected, uh, Sucheta, especially personally for me, a really great conversation talking about Alzheimer's and dementia. An awful lot uh, that I learned from this conversation, I can assure you. Any initial thoughts here you want to share? Yes, and such an important conversation to have. And Ken is such a wealth of information, and I'm so grateful to know him as a friend. So here's some what triggered in my brain as I was listening to this conversation that we didn't get, get into this, but uh, the idea of normal aging. This didn't come up, but literature talks about something called crystallized intelligence, which refers to the accumulation of information or knowledge based on one's life experience. So for example, the uh, crystallized intelligence is made up of skills and ability and knowledge that is a uh, well-practiced, overlearned, and very familiar. So for example, you know, knowing the capital of a uh, uh, country when we have our vocabulary items or knowing the meaning of the uh, words that we have learned 
early on and, and they become crystallized, they become permanent, imprinted in the brain. Funny thing is that research shows that what's described as crystallized ability, it either remains stable or it even gradually improves at the rate of 0.02 to almost 0.003 standard deviation per year through the sixth and seventh decade of decades of life. <laughs> so hence, compared to the younger adults, the older adults tend to perform better on tasks requiring intelligence that's based on knowledge or tasks that require accessing uh, prior knowledge. And that goes into problem solving, for example. In contrast, then there is something called fluid cognitive domains, uh, which includes skills like uh, speed of processing, uh, psychomotor ability, and uh, memory, and even executive function. So it refers to skills and abilities that involve reasoning, uh, problem solving, taking decisions, kind of uh, prioritizing. And these set of skills, they are fluid and the reason they are referred to as fluid skills is because they are not dependent on uh, past knowledge or prior learning. It is uh, l uh, literally uh, refers to application skill. How well do you apply the knowledge that you have? So a simple example, which is not the best example, but if you uh, want to open a can, you take a can opener and you use the can opener to open the can. What if you have a can opener that is not yours and you are, let's say, Todd, you're visiting me and I give you my can opener, by the way, you will spend extra minutes figuring out how to use that can opener. And that knowing how to open cans using a can opener is not, is your prior knowledge, but how to operate this particular can opener Maybe the reason your spot, uh, processing speed may be slowed down because you're unfamiliar with the task itself. And by the way, I do have a, a can opener, which I use often in my presentations, that most people take at least five extra minutes to figure out, or sometimes people give up. <laughs> so anyways, what I was saying that these uh, fluid cognitive domains reflect more the innate ability that how we process and learn information, how we maneuver our own environment, and how we solve problems that we are not familiar with. Researchers such as Salthaus and his colleagues in their 2012 article talked about this, that these abilities, predominantly speed of processing and psychomotor abilities, reach their peak by the third decade of life. And then there's a gradual decline in, in, uh, at the estimated rate of a 0.02 standard deviation per year. So these age-related changes are self-evident, but may or may, may not lead to dramatic decline in lifestyle or quality of life. So as I was um, having a conversation with Ken, uh, my thoughts were that there, there's like a, you know, two ladders next to each other. Uh, one that's going up, which is you become more knowledge you have, more um, living you have done, greater the wisdom. And then the second ladder that where you, the skills decline, and that's when your executive function, your memory skills, and your speed of processing. So together, that's what uh, makes you a wise old fool, <laughs> so to speak. Well, just thinking about the can opener. I mean, uh, we mentioned my mother at the top of the show. Uh, she's at that phase of this disease now where she can open a drawer and she won't know what that is. She'll pull it out and she'll say, I don't know. I don't know what this is. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. Now, she's still at the phase, though, that when I explain it to her or show her, then she then she recalls it and then can use it just fine. You know, then it, but she's also at the phase where any given day she may know exactly what it is. The next day she doesn't. You know, so it's it comes and goes, which is you know, very common in that disease. So I'm very, I'm very familiar with the with how not understanding what a can opener is or whatever the device is, a toothbrush from time to time or, or you know, an umbrella even. I mean, it's just been interesting to see what she remembers and, and what she doesn't and then how it changes from day to day. It's fascinating stuff. All right, so continuing on, I think it's important also to understand that all these age-related changes that you're talking about, I mean, it goes just beyond forgetting why you walked into a, a particular room, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, getting older uh, is certainly not a picnic. Uh, we kind of have discussed that, and it's commonsensical, I guess. And there's a small amount of decline in mental function that everybody experiences. And, you know, I, 
forgetting names as comes to mind that we have talked about. So uh, on the other hand, uh, the onset of dementia tends to be gradual and insidious, and the early symptoms can be easily dismissed as normal aging, hence they can be missed. And my conversation with Dr. Kosick uh, uh, was talking, uh, uh, was about these three distinct categories when we talk about these uh, changes in cognition and in fact, not just limited to cognition, but general social and emotional welfare. You know, there are three distinct processes. One is that normal aging or cognitive aging, and it is a real thing. The second is mild cognitive impairment. And then the third is that actual dementia and Alzheimer's being one kind of dementia. So in normal aging, there's certainly slowing of the processing speed, difficulty in word retrieval, short-term memory challenges, but there's no uh, decline in the way uh, we function or the individual functions. The person describes or uh, feels that he's meeting expectations and going about life perfectly fine. In the mild cognitive impairment, however, that there's a, in, a very, as uh, you know, Ken talked about, there's the indistinct line or the gray zone where the symptoms persist and they become worrisome. And then the finally, when it becomes extremely detectable, which is when in neurological terms, these are called frank symptoms. You know, they're distinct. Uh, they present themselves in lumps. There are more than one areas that are affected. And you, just by talking with such individuals, you can tell there's something wrong. So it's the mild cognitive impairment and distinguishing that from the normal aging. That's where the art and the science meets, I feel. Well, yeah, no doubt about it. It's, I mean, it goes without saying, aging affects your entire body and the brain. And, and obviously, changes in the brain are not visible. Um, if you, and speaking of my mother again, if you, were to, if you were to watch her walk down the hallway in her community, you would not know that she is late stage dementia, Alzheimer's. She is the, one of the few residents of that community that actually can get around without help of a walker or a wheelchair or even assistance. I mean, so she's still physically pretty functional, but you know, we all, we all know her brain is, is severely diseased. So it's a, uh, but talk more about that. You're right, Todd, you know, brain is highly wired machine and the connectivity determines uh, its agility. And we have a few uh, guesses as to what goes inside the brain and researchers like can study this. You know, I remember reading in his book about as he summarized what causes the brain changes and first component being inflammation, uh, which is the response of the immune system, which is to send protein, which in, induces swelling, redness, and in a short quantities and for a short term while it's good but a chronic state of inflammation without any respite is not that great. And then, of course, prolonged inflammation speeds up aging. And uh, the second part is the oxidization. You know, the imbalance between the oxidized particles and the antioxidants can alter the brain chemistry, causing damage. And the third thing he describes that the wear and tear that the just like the body, the brain endures that wear and tear. So for for example, unlike the rest of the body, the damage to the neurons, which are the brain cells, that damage is not reversible. You know, it's not repairable. So they don't regenerate themselves. So tearing or strain on these nerve cells causes a breakdown in communication between the neurons, resulting in slowing down, and it leads to forgetfulness and slowness in processing. So it's kind of important to understand that the brain actually aging um, can be detected at the brain level. And it's a well, funny thing about the brain, as you know, is the brain is the highly wrinkled body part. And that is one body part that you do not want to lose your wrinkles. Uh, you want to keep them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand that. I think it was also important that we discussed the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's. Now, Alzheimer's is a form of dementia, but they're different, right? And what was striking to me was his comment that if you live long enough, you will likely suffer from dementia, but not necessarily Alzheimer's. Uh, go deeper there. Yeah, and that was the, the discussion we were uh, having, right? That I think it's the presentation of symptoms and their, how to decipher all that is such a critical part of management too. The Alzheimer's Association has it on their website that dementia is a, gen is a general term for loss of memory and other mental abilities uh, severe enough to interfere with daily life. And that's the critical part, severe enough to interfere with daily life. 
It is caused by physical changes in the brain. Alzheimer is the most common type of dementia, but there are many other kinds of dementia. And so the, I'm going to put a link there. We have lots of uh, types of dementia, but discussing this Alzheimer's particularly, uh, as Ken was explaining, that it's the kind of dementia where the few things that are happening, one is the it takes a slow course, that means progression of uh, impairment or decline happens over the years and not overnight. Second was uh, that the impairment is in more than one cognitive domain, so it's not exclusively limited to memory. And the third is the diagnosis is a diagnosis of exclusion. That means the blood test and the scans can rule out other problems, which then eventually focuses, zooms into Alzheimer's. And so then there are cognitive and emotional domains where the changes appear. And so the most important thing is to not really, I guess, avoid <laughs> uh, having to deal with the, the challenges that one, in, one is noticing. You know, the the most important thing for me that, again, you know, aren't you fascinated by our body and brain when they work well? We don't have any concerns. We become very alerted about things when they are not working. You know, when you're walking well, you don't thank your legs. But when your knees hurt, you're like, well, what must be the reason, you know? <laughs> so similarly, I feel that, you know, the two degenerative processes that Ken was talking about in Alzheimer's is really something that everybody needs to get more information about is one is that the amyloid beta protein that oozes out and clumps into plaques, and then they accumulate all over the brain, causing the disruption in cognition, perception, and processing. And uh, the interesting thing about that is it's all over the brain. And so it's unlike a brain injury or gunshot wound, uh, we call that a diffused versus focal injury. So this is a very focal, it's not rather, this is not focal at all. And second thing is that um, he talked about tau protein, which causes the neurons to misfire and eventually it causes them to die. And of course, the tau protein help neuron maintain their structure and function. And without them, there's a disruption in the way brain, brain functions altogether. So most important thing about memory, you know, is that memory is, of course, it's the synaptic connection. That means the two brain cells, neurons, are communicating each, each other through exchange of impulses, electric impulses, and more exchange, a robust exchange, greater the communication and greater cognitive ability and memory, and, and less and less firing or, um, or less and less communication between the neurons. That means less and less chances of that area of the brain being cognitively robust. And that's exactly what happens with Alzheimer's. And so that almost like um, what comes to visualization comes to mind is like a dimming, you know, light that begins to dim and then flicker and then not work. Uh, similarly, there's a diminished kind of intensity to the or the volume to that communication that happens between the neurons. And that decline is causes the end of one's robust cognitive functions, I guess. Yeah, that's what has been, I don't want people to get the wrong idea when I say it's been fascinating to observe this because it's been, it's been cruel and horrible, but it, it's been an amazing process to observe because, you know, this dimming process is exactly what my mom's gone through. It hasn't been this slow, unnoticeable, gradual change. It's like she goes through like these plateaus, right? There's these stages where she evolves into a, a state and then is, exists that way for a while. And then there's a noticeable sudden kind of change that then lasts for another while. You know, I don't know that how her course will always be, but it's been, but dimming is a is an interesting way to think of that. So fascinating stuff, goodness gracious. So gosh, before we go, Suchet, any, uh, any concluding thoughts? Yeah, you know, I've been thinking a lot about aging and age-related changes. And, you know, recently there was a book that I was reading that old master's great artist in old age uh, written by Thomas Dormandy. And he talks about that, all the case histories point in one direction, the extraordinary flowering of artistic genius in old age. So he particularly in this book talked about these incredible artists who continue to be robust in their practices and in prolific artists and produce some incredible work. You know, for example, Monet, when we think about Monet, we think about water lilies. And uh, you know this, that the water lilies is not a name of a single painting, but it's rather a series of works. And Mo Monet painted about close to 250 water lilies. And it was a subject that he kept revisiting throughout his life. 
when Monet turned 82, he was diagnosed with severe cataract in his right eye and a, a mild one in his left eye, well, which made it impossible to see. And then Monet underwent three sort of cataract surgeries on his right eye, which did not um, give him any relief. Uh, in fact, you know, it got his eyesight, I think, um, got worse, but he continued to work. You know, he painted water lilies during this time titled Japanese Bridge, and there's, uh, you can look it up on the web, but it's dominated by reds and oranges, which is so beautiful and vibrant, which kind of invokes this sense of vibrancy. So even though he wasn't functioning at his best, he still persisted in, and produced this incredible thing. And when he died in 1926, you know, the paint on his last water lily was still not dry. Um, why am I talking about this? That there's so many artists, including Monet, who continued to be wonderfully productive and wonderfully functional till the end. Michelangelo was 89 when he died. Matisse, uh, when he died at 84, was still very artistically engaged. Uh, Picasso at 91 was a prolific art producer. O'Keefe, same thing, 98. So I think it's at one end, we are dis dis discussing Alzheimer's. Then we have this other end of the spectrum where we have these age-related changes impacting people and yet them staying engaged in life. And I feel that what can we do as we have a discussion, you know, even you as a son of a mom who's going through this disease and its impact on her, you know, how do you stay, stay um, you know, hopeful and connected with your life is uh, what comes to my mind. So one is, I feel one must uh, be vigilant and one must report symptoms. Uh, there's no need to feel shame or fear once you notice things like losing things, getting lost, disoriented, forgetting procedures, or notice that you're avoiding complex thoughts. That's important to address. It's a complex disease. You know, it's emergence is insidious and subtle for sure. And it takes away the independence and self-worth. It affects family and managing loved ones' need is a top concern for everybody. And so we must take this seriously, but um, I think we must stay engaged and as helpful. And the last comment I will make is about executive function. You know, uh, the kinds of executive function symptoms that are evident in uh, um, cases of Alzheimer's are difficulty planning and problem solving, difficulty in completing familiar tasks, kind of uh, determining time and place of execution, you know, finding the right words to use to describe ideas, you know, take difficulty in making decisions, particularly complex decisions such as planning a vacation, weighing options, choosing the right insurance, signing up for services, all those require complex abstract comparison and contrasting and taking multiple factors into consideration. And that can be really, really difficult. But most people are living independently when the spouses die or perhaps if you are particularly mobile, you may not be living in a nursing home. So th nobody may be interacting with you or you may not be interacting. And so that's why loved ones have such a responsibility to dig deep into the daily lives of these individuals. But I'm very hopeful. I'm hopeful that we as a community can do a lot together. But the first step is to understand. And that's what we try to do today. Well, I, uh, no surprise, uh, really benefited from the conversation as well. And, and I'll echo what you just hinted at there. Yeah, there's the Alzheimer's patient that we have to think about, care about, manage uh, their care and look after them. But, you know, the caregivers are suffering through this as well. And, and, you know, I'm blessed to have a supportive family to help me get through that. But uh, that is something that you must be very mindful of uh, when you're going through this uh, for a loved one who's suffering because the caregivers, uh, they have a hard time with this and, and they need support and care and love as well. So uh, that's uh, almost as equal, equally important a part of this whole conversation uh, uh, than just the patient. So great stuff. Well, I am... Uh, I am very much looking forward to our next conversation with Dr. Kosick. Um, I believe he's going to share with us a couple of hints about how we can uh, do some things now to be proactive and try to prevent this. So it's going to be a great conversation. All right. Well, that's it for today. On behalf of our host, Sucheta Kamath, and all of us at Cerebral Matters, thank you for tuning in and listening today. And we look forward to seeing you again right here next week on Full Prefrontal. 
Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive functions. To contact our host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive functions, visit her website at CerebralMatters.com. That's CerebralMatters.com. Tune in next week for the next informative episode of Full Prefrontal.